Yankee and the Brits, the place to be. Radio living is the life for me. Airwaves spreading out so far and wide. Keep your FM, just give me that internet side. Online is where I'd rather stay. I've got a lot of music to play. I just adore a Yankee view. Darling, I love you, but give me a show to do. The Chap. The Brats. On air. That's fair. You are my wife. Goodbye, British life. The Yankee and the Brit on air. Sunday <laughs> night, <laughs> Sunday the 20th of May. And on the dog and bone, we have Colin Axwell. Say hello, Colin. Hello, everybody. How you guys doing? Hey. Doing all right, Mr. Axwell. What's with the triple X? Getting kind of sexy. <laughs> yeah, you know, honestly, uh, I see a lot of people with names that, um, I don't want to say they're forgettable, but I wanted to make sure that people, at least they didn't remember my name exactly, at least they had a reason to. <laughs> it sounds it sounds really weird, but it was sort of a marketing thing. I want I wanted people to say, uh, you know, I don't remember his name, but yeah, it was a guy with the three X's. Should, I remember that. X should we call on you, the Yankee and the Brit show. Should we call you Mr. X or Triple X? Uh, you know, it's funny, when I first got started with that name, I was back in a I was playing in a hard rock band in Massachusetts and it was what did they call me? Um it was Triple Triple Axwell. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they used to call me was Triple Axwell. Hey, that's not bad. That's pretty cool. Triple Axwell. Axwell. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. No, Colin's call, fine. Colin's call, fine. So tell us about your music. When did you get started? Oh, can you ever really put a finger on it? I mean, most of us have been playing music or singing or doing something since we were born. It feels like, anyway. Not to so some you, of the people we've been talking to. So you were dancing around <laughs> your room to Elvis Presley in your underpants <laughs> when you were about two years old. Well, yeah, I mean, my dad was pretty musical. I want to say it was probably more like the Eagles and the Beach Boys back in those days. But, you know, he had that rack of CDs back when those were a thing that people bought. And, um, you know, he'd steal, I'd steal the CDs off the rack and I'd listen to Garth and Alan Jackson and Van Halen and Chicago, whatever. I mean, I didn't know anything about music back then, so I'd just pull random CDs off and start finding out what my dad was into and that sort of... So you must be quite young if you say CDs. Well, 30, 33, if I have to admit it, yeah. Ah. <laughs> That's still pretty young. Yeah, you see, I'm 39, and we had we had cassettes and right up until my early teens, and then everybody started getting CDs, so like, <clears throat> yeah, I guess. We had, uh, we had cassettes earlier on. Um, I remember I stole my dad's No Fences CD, I mean, sorry, cassette and wore I mean, I wore it out. I, I don't even think it works anymore. So I'm, I'm right there with you. But uh, yeah, things change. The technology changes in such a short amount of time. It's, it's hard to keep up with. I think it's getting even worse. You know, just with did the you, internet, it's, it seems like things change every day. Did you carry a pencil around with you back then? No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't so much into songwriting until later. No, uh, I meant to rewind your cassettes. Oh, right, right. Uh, <laughs> It's yeah, it's funny if you put if you put a cassette and a pencil in front of a kid nowadays, they wouldn't even understand what that was for. So oh, that nowadays no, it would I, be for writing down the words. That's right, that's right, or for chewing on while you're working out your anxiety. <laughs> hey, and it wasn't just for rewinding them; it was for when the cassette got jammed in your player and there was just loads of right. tape everywhere, and you had to wind it all the way back in. Right, you got tape spaghetti. Yeah. I'm sixty now, and that's probably why I have lead poisoning from chewing on my pencil from my cassettes. Yeah, that's back before they started making them out of graphite, right? <laughs> that's before dirt. <laughs> Did I hear you say you played in a rock band? Oh, I've been around the gamut, man. Um, rock, metal. I mean, college was the cover band circuit. So, yeah, I mean, you, if you like music, you it doesn't matter, honestly. Right. I sing country better, so that's when I finally got to the point where I wanted to front a band. That's what I started doing, and I'd, I've listened to country my whole life. But when you live in a place like New England... You're going to find that not everybody's a huge country fan of that way. A lot of the uh, the market leans towards rock and uh, pop and metal. And, you know, I, I had to go to high school up there, so you gravitate towards what people so, don't want to hear. I so guess. what made you settle on country then? Um, always liked it. I mean, my dad was in the Air Force, so we moved all over the country. I spent a lot of time down south. I think we lived in New Mexico for four years. Florida, Southern California isn't really southern, but... 
uh, always always grew up on country music. Always liked the idea of the songs actually telling a story. Yes, and maybe maybe transporting the listener from the beginning of the song to the end of the song. It, it feels like you've actually gone through some sort of transformation, which I I really enjoy. The older I get, the more I enjoy that aspect of country music. And um, and you know, I'm not a pop singer. It's it, there's just not a vocal quality there for pop music. And you just you sort of figure that out. There's there's a reason why somebody comes on the scene and it takes 10 years for them to develop themselves to a point where they can actually get out in front of a substantial audience and, you know, open for artists that um, are established because it takes you a while to figure out what it is you do well and, and how to do it better. So are you, where are you in this, uh, in this game, I guess, for lack of a better word? Are you already playing opening act? You know, are you an opening act for people now? <laughs> um, I've done it. When I was up in New England, I was doing, uh, I had a lot of traction. Um, we just before I left down for Nashville, we had played a big Florida Georgia Line show. Um, I think who else was there? Cadillac Three, maybe. And we did some shows with people like Josh Thompson. Um, who else? There, there was a handful. But the problem is, is just as I was getting into it, I started to realize that there was a ceiling up there in New England for country music, and I really had to get down to a place where everything was happening. So last year, I moved down to Nashville, and it's kind of reset itself because i'm working myself into all kinds of new markets if that makes any sense yeah sure wow. yeah so, so so i'm back to blindly booking clubs in the middle of nowhere and going down grassroots and making new fans and then oh. it's honestly we played lions georgia last week and that's right in the, the heart of where guys like um i think cole swindell luke bryan came from i mean those are the people that really love what we're doing so i mean trade-off isn't so bad is this all you do now or do you still have a day job Oh, to be honest with you, if I didn't work a day job, I, I honestly have no idea how anybody would afford this. That much, huh? What do you do in your day job? Well, I work in the construction industry. I fly around the country. We do uh, insulated metal panels on, on really large buildings. For I'm actually working on LaGuardia Airport in New York right now, so they fly up there and or they fly me up there and I manage the projects. And um, The nice thing is, is I get to keep all my airline points and all of the hotel points and car rentals and things like that, which helps out so much when sure. I'm doing things like flying out to a show, meeting with the guys, we got to get a hotel room. And a lot of that stuff for me is paid for by my job. So it's not necessarily the fact that I'm making money and that helps me afford things like recording and vehicles. But I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of costs that aren't on paper, like free hotel rooms and flying guys to gigs. If I need a fiddling guy, I can fly a guy there almost for free. It's, it's really nice. Is that uh, prefab stuff you build? <laughs> um, well, we have a shop here in Nashville. So we do, um, we do the fabrication here, and it's uh, I mean, it's kind of like putting a big puzzle together on the outside of a building. Yeah, I know so all about it. So it's partially, it. yeah, it's partially prefabbed, but it's also, you know, there's a, there's a lot of the guys in the field. They um, they're very skilled, and there's a lot of plumbing and leveling that has to go on to make these things straight. So I think the construction trade is pretty cool. It's amazing the things you get to see and do, and how you know how things actually work and how they're built and what holds them together in a 300 mile an hour wind and blah blah blah. <laughs> Yeah, you, you got to be careful because it's a. If you let it, that's an industry that will it'll chew you up and spit you out. Oh. I mean, it's like it's like it's like music. So you kind of have to realize that at the end of the day, you're doing it for money. I don't want to say this because it sounds bad, but I work for money. I I play music because I enjoy it, and I have to be able to leave that that part of me behind when i leave on a friday afternoon you know you can't you can't let it interfere too much and you can't think about it or drive you crazy oh geez don't let it make you feel bad that's the only reason i work is for money i mean we all have to do that otherwise where would we be that's right that's right and people i mean people forget it yeah well it doesn't take much it's, to remind them when all of a sudden they can't buy their groceries well i know i mean pe people forget that i don't know the best way to put this i've um i've come to terms with the fact that there's always going to be a job out there you know but there's not always going to be the opportunity to go play music if you're not careful. So. That's that's right. Do you write your own music? I do. I do. Do you remember the first song that you ever wrote? What was it about? Mm, well, I wrote a lot of lyrics before I started writing actual songs. I, I don't know. It was probably some generic love the girl country song, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Just, just regurgitating the things that I've heard my, my heroes writing. But to be fair, mimicry is a, is a pretty high form of flattery. And, and that's how you learn to do things is, you you know, at the earliest age, you watch your parents and then you get older and you watch somebody that inspires you. And um, it takes a little while to actually get to a point where you are, well, it takes a little while to learn. And, and until you actually learn what you're doing, then you can kind of put your own flavor on it, if that makes any sense. Sure. Yeah. Have you written anything for anybody else? Uh, no, I'm... 
I mean, if somebody wanted to record one of my songs, that's fine. I don't have a problem with it, but there's a lot of stuff that I write that I can only picture myself singing. You know, a lot of a lot of people take themselves a little too seriously, and which is fine. I mean, don't get me wrong. They got dude, you can do whatever you want, but I'm a little bit looser in my songwriting. And I mean, when I write a song called Hillbilly Striptease, there's only two two or three people I can think of that would ever want to sing that. <laughs> one of them is me. <laughs> I'd like to go to one of those shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's actually a song about the the hillbilly guy stripping for his woman. Oh, well, in that case, I'll stay home. <laughs> Come on, husband, get stripping. I thought maybe I'd get there. I thought maybe I'd get to see my sister and my dad. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but you under but you understand like I'm not afraid to touch on on stranger things like that and you know, you put those in front of a publishing company, they're going to go, "Yeah, like we have this whole handful of stuff over here that's not racy and we'll probably uh, not offend anybody." So That's right. We're all we're all set. <laughs> yeah, he- heaven forbid if you'd step outside the box even for a second. And that's that's the thing I'm talking about. Like, how do, I don't understand. Well, for a lot of people that song write, like they go to these publishers, and that is their job. It's just what we were talking about before. Like my job's construction. Their job is writing for publishers. Personally, I couldn't put myself in a room every single day and write to radio. I just can't do it. Tell us about the song. Look up. What's it about? You know, they say that if you hang out with a songwriter, you always run the risk of being put in a song. And I actually went on a date. Gosh, where were we? I think it was in Boston with this girl who um, I won't I won't name her because that seems that seems probably bad. But not I went on this date. Yeah, it's not important. But she just looked at her phone all night, <laughs> and I wanted to grab her. I wanted to grab her and shake her in a nonviolent way. That right there makes her unimportant. Right, right. But you know they. Uh, I like to say that if you get a good song out of something, then it wasn't a waste of time. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> wasn't a wasted date. <laughs> right, so the date wasn't wasted, but the whole time that she was there looking at her phone and I was just kind of watching, I think there was a band on it. And I just thought, man, if you could just, if you would just look up from that thing, I mean, you'd see there's, you know, maybe not the guy for you, but at least a decent guy in front of you. And, you know, there's a good band. If, if not, like, if I'm not your, your thing, like, there's a good band over there. And there's, there's a lot of people around just kind of living life and... I almost feel like everybody with their phones, they're involved in a life they want to have rather than the one they do have. And it's almost like, it's almost like everything you see online is some, it's like everybody else's fantasies too. So everybody's just living in this fantasy world of wanting it to be better than, than it is. And it's just not the way life goes. But the least you can do is look up and, and see the people around you that want to be with you and they, you know, are, that want to enjoy your company. Kind of yeah, scary. Yeah. It's almost like living in a virtual world all the time. Right. Well, it, it is, is as well because you know, like when when women and guys post selfies, you know, there's the, there's those there's that kind of person that doesn't care what they look like when they post selfies, and then there's the flip side to it where people only <coughs> show the good sides. You know, they they only show themselves if they look absolutely stunning in the photos. Right. And, um, it is. It leads people into a false. It's 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 a false version of you. They only write the good things online. They don't. You know, yeah, it, makes, it makes people think that your life is perfect and nobody's life is perfect. But it's certainly easy to look at someone's life on Facebook and think they must have it all. You know, I'm so jealous. Right. It's it's I mean, it goes back to pictures, I guess, for the same way. You look at someone's photo album and you'd think they were happy every day. And I think that maybe feeds into a lot of uh, I think I think there's a lot more depression and anxiety around the world. And honestly, I attribute a lot of that to being connected online and I mean, you go to somebody's house in the past, you'd look at a photo album and they look happy, but you're not looking at that photo album every day that you wake up. I mean, you don't wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning and look at someone's photo album and see how how much happier they are than you. It's it's just really changed yeah. the game, and I, and I feel bad for a lot of people because they don't realize that 9 times out of 10, those people that you're looking at probably are having a worse time off in life than you are, but you know, you're looking up to them wanting, you know, wanting something different out of your life when it's pretty probably pretty good do you have your own band i do i do nashville is kind of a funny place because everybody down here is looking for work all the time and and most people that are in town um they play for money you know they don't have any other job so i got a poor group of guys who i try to get on every gig but uh, for example last night's gig down in florida i had to hire a bass player and a guitar player and they kind of had to learn this stuff so they did a good job it's not necessarily preferable to do it that way because they don't they're not as tight with the band but you know it is what it is. It's part of living down here. Yeah, that would seem kind of tough trying to just pull somebody basically off the street, come in and play my songs for me, and they'd be like, 
okay, what are we playing, you know? How does a guy, whether he's a drummer or a guitarist or whatever, how did, how can he possibly just snap his fingers and get into the mood that your music and your song sets? It just seems tough. It's tough. It is tough. And you'd be surprised how many people actually do it. The good thing is, in Nashville, there's a lot of pro guys. So if one guy can't do it, there's another guy that can. And you just got to you got to figure out who your backups are. And I'm, I'm still in the process of doing that. Um, it's frustrating as, as a, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't like the idea of having my name across everything until I realized, I don't want to say that I was alone in this, but I mean, I'm time wise and money wise. I'm the biggest investor. And well, of course. Um, I, I appreciate the guys I play with, but at the end of the day, like they can come and go whenever they want to. Right. So you build, you build up, I don't want to say an empire, but you, you build up your product and you build up um, your repertoire of songs and and you just fill in where you have to, you know. Have what? you ever called any of these uh, these um, outside players that you just need on a moment? Have you ever had one that you've called up and explained everything to him and he says like, uh, "No, dude, I can't do that kind of thing." No, um, it's it's kind of the other way around because every, everybody in Nashville, again, these these uh, utility players, they need. I don't want to say they need the money, but some of them do. Yeah, but that's what they do. They, they're hired guns. They make their money doing this. And it's much more likely that a guy will show up and not play well than a guy say, no, I don't want to. So they don't want to take the chance of missing a gig. Yeah, a lot of times that's true. A lot of times that's true. Some guys have, will have like a specific, specific amount of money they want to make. So I'm not making six, seven grand a gig. I can't afford to give everybody $1,000 to go play a show. It's just, right. And if guys are on that level, they, then guys will certainly say, yeah, that's not enough money for me. But other than that, usually not. Well, going back to the uh, going back to the mobile phone things, me and Randy will go out. We'll go for breakfast, for example, and you'll see sure. a couple together, and they will both have their heads in the phones. There is nothing more irritating to us. You know, we go out, the phones in the bag. We sit there and we talk. We actually have a conversation. We look at each other, um, and there's nothing more irritating than uh, than looking across the other tables and just seeing that people are... A few weeks ago, we saw a grandma, a mother, a daughter, and a little <laughs> boy, and they had an iPad, they had the phones, you know, a little, yeah. the little boy had earbuds in, and we could not believe that they spent the time to go out for breakfast, and they all sat there on the social networking. But one thing I was about to ask you, going back to the mobile phones thing, was do you find it irritating when you're on the stage and you're singing and people are filming you because I because I have this little thing in my head I like to film things I'm a bit of a happy snapper myself but sometimes I like to put the phone in my bag and just look at it take it all in with my eyes mm -hmm. and you miss you miss so much going on around you because you're trying to get the perfect view in your screen in that little tiny screen you know what's your thoughts <clears throat> do you ever tell people to put the phone away <laughs> you know I don't I think that if anybody wants to take out your phone and film what you're doing, it's it's flattering. It yeah. really is. Um, I personally don't go to a concert and take out a phone. I, I want I want to watch the concert with my own eyes. And right. I don't feel the need to share that with anybody. At the end of the day, I have this funny thing. I actually wrote a song about it a long time ago when I was in college, and it it was called "Stop Stealing My Memories." <laughs> and, um, there you go. It's basically it's basically like listen. This is my experience. This is, I mean, I paid for this ticket to go to this concert, to watch this concert, and to have this experience. Like, you know what? If you want this experience, you do that. You come to this concert and you see it. But th these are my memories, and they're they're for me and who I'm with, and and that's where it ends. How can you share a memory like that, really? I mean, you know, you can take pictures of the moment, you know, but how can right. you share looking around in a concert and see, you know, whether it's smoke in the air and or or whatever's well, even, going on around you. How can you share those? Those are all in your head. That's your own personal stuff. That's that's right. And there's a lot of things that are never going to translate onto a phone video. I mean, the, there's certain frequencies that phone videos aren't going to pick up. I mean, if you were at a Queen concert and they start playing um, uh, We Will Rock You, right? Yeah. And you're in a, and you're in a stadium with 60,000 people and they start stomping their feet on the ground. I mean, how are you going to recreate that exactly. to somebody on a cell? It's not even worth it. Like, Why would you try <laughs> what about the crazy couple next to you smoking a joint and passing it around to about 15 people they don't even know and they're all laughing and having fun and you just happen to glance over and see everybody smiling and enjoying the music and, and like you I said, know, weird, stomping right? your feet? You can't 
it's just that's it. That's yours. That belongs to you. And I'm so glad right. back in the concert days when I used to go to them that I didn't have a phone or we didn't have a camera or any of that stuff. It was great. I can still remember, you know, going and seeing Heart and uh, Genesis and some of these great concerts. Oh, for sure. And I can still see that in my head, but I can't ever share that with anybody. I could never explain the experience. That belongs to you me. Can't. That's where I wanted to stay. Yeah, and yeah. I'm... Yeah, I just wondered it, if and... you have, if you ever, you know, look at people in the in the audience and think, why don't you put that thing away? Well, here's the beautiful thing with a song like "Look Up." There, there is probably like once, I don't know, once every three shows. I'll be getting ready to to play that song, and I'll look out, and there'll be people on their phones, and and I start, and I'll talk about it. Like sometimes I won't. Sometimes I'll just say, "This is a song I wrote about cell phones and how much I hate them," and then we'll we'll play. <laughs> and then sometimes, if I look out in the audience, and people's faces are lit up because you can see them. You're like, "Oh wow, okay, that person's on their phone. That person's on their phone." You look right at them, and you say, "You ever you ever out with somebody who just won't look up from their cell phone, and you just you look at them?" <laughs> you know, you have that experience, don't you? <laughs> yeah, it's not so. It's very, it's a very passive aggressive way of saying I'm talking about you. Like you're the one, <laughs> and they're so busy with their phones they don't get it. Uh, some of them do. Some of them, some of them look up in embarrassment, and I feel bad. But honestly, it's like you came out to see a show. If you think we're bad, I guess whatever. But um, it's more of a broad, it's more of a broad message to just say, guys, what are you doing? Yeah, I don't even own a phone. I got rid of mine. I can't stand them. They're nothing but a pain in the ass. We have one phone um, for business, and I can text my brother and call mom and whatever. But that's the end of it. Yeah, it's not so bad. If I could do it, I would. Yeah, well, uh, we'd get rid of ours completely if we could, but, you know, that's that's the world. What are you going to do? <laughs> Interestingly enough, um, I think there was a time when social media was really helpful with the artists, and that was probably five years ago, maybe five, four years ago, and things have gotten so, I guess I guess the, the social media web has gotten so inundated with content that it's made it really, really difficult for people to sift through any of it. Yeah. So... I look at things like Facebook and Instagram and and even Spotify to an extent, and it's so accessible to everybody to put stuff on that. Um, it, it's almost irrelevant these days. I, I have a feeling that live shows are going to be coming back around. I really do. Well, I hope it's soon. Yeah, well, you can't. I think people are getting tired of going online and, and not understanding what they what they should be looking at. Like People are going to get back into going to shows and feeling you know, feeling those feelings you were just talking about. Just yeah, but they'll take their immersed. phones. They'll take their phones and share it on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, they will, and no one will care. They'll get five likes, and then and then they'll put something else up. It's it's all about. I've the given likes. up on. I've given up on social media for the most part. I've gone back to. I, w I went away from it for three weeks. I didn't touch it, and life was fine. Yeah, it's funny. You your, whole, your whole world didn't even fall apart, did it? It didn't. So uh, you know, it's. I don't want to go away from it totally, but. Half an hour a day, maybe, I'm going to give to it just to put up shows. And there's still people that use it, so I'll update my, my calendars and stuff. But, but wasting wasting eight hours a day keeping up with social media, is it's almost, I don't know, it seems like the time for that's passed. Where do you do a lot of your songs at? In a studio there in Nashville? Yeah, I've got to, I got to get back to recording some more. It's funny you should ask, because I was just thinking about whether or not I was going to pay another producer you know, fifteen hundred to two grand a song to do this, or if I was going to take that money and go to recording school and just learn so I could record for the rest of my life. Um, but the, but the last EP we did, like songs like "Look Up," those, those were done over down at uh, Sony at Music Row. So we uh, we didn't spare much expense on those ones, and they they turned out pretty good. If I oh, if I don't mind bragging, the ones we have, I think they're fantastic. Hell yeah, that's a great tune. What's the story behind that? Um, no storyline, just. Wanted to write a fun song, you know. It's it's one of those rare instances where I just say, "Hey, you know, let's let's write a song where people can sing it with me." Yeah, exactly. Because I was just I've only listened to it once yet so far, but I just I picked up some of the lyrics. I thought that's pretty cool. That's a good way to put some of that. Well, and, and that's the other thing too. I, I also like to prove that I can write a fun summer song without it being all fluff. You know, it's not it's not talking about coolers and beers and boats. Um, but, but again, it's fine, but. There is an opportunity to tell a story with some depth to it, even if it is a song that just says "hell yeah" a bunch of times. And <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes the lyrics in some songs are so easy, I don't know how they can even sing it. Like "bird" is the word. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, that's the Trashman, right? Yeah, she, she hate hates that, that song, and I can't play it enough, you know, because I'm just it's, I'm an old school like that, anyways. But she can't stand. I'm not it. We have actually. 
We have actually considered putting that in a medley in one of our shows. Oh, do oh, it. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> do it. Do it. Right. No. We, we play La Bamba now sometimes, and people love it. La, 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 la. God, I can't stand that song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, people don't people don't hear it, and it's it's a fun song. We we were gonna do we we're gonna do a mashup of like "Bird Is the Word," the Macarena, and uh, something else. I can't remember, but it just be one of those. It goes back to an experience, you know. You you want to go to a show and you go, oh yeah, like I remember that was fun. We were they were in the middle of the set and they played these songs that we we all think are ridiculous, but what we all know the Macarena and all started doing it because it reminds us of fifth grade. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, I you, you I get your point perfectly though. That does make kind of good sense to just throw something in there, kind of you know, tips the nostalgia. scale to one side a little bit. Yeah, you could, yeah, I guess nostalgic. You could say sure because you know when everybody out, knows when the people words. are out. You know everybody knows yeah. the words to all those. That's that's well, Macarena is in Spanish, so maybe not. But <laughs> everybody owns that chorus, "Hey Macarena." Oh, absolutely. We own right. it, right? <laughs> and as, and as much as they hate it, it, as much as everybody says they hate the electric slide when they go to a wedding and someone plays it, you, you bet your ass everybody's out there dancing to the electric slide or the dance. They, they're going to do it. That's right. Well, you, it's like you just can't help it. Go ahead. What's the future for Colin Axwell? You know, what do you see in your future plans? Do you want to travel? Do you travel a lot with it already? Where do you want to travel to? Do you want to travel around the world? Um, well, I, I want to play music. And we've been, I bought an RV, which we've taken out a couple times. But, you know, we, we've already done some shows in Florida and Georgia. I got a show in North Carolina scheduled to come up. So we're already doing some traveling. Um, what I'm probably going to do is really minimize what I play to certain types of venues. Um, there's a lot of places that you know can't can't afford to have a decent man come play, which is fine, but it, it doesn't really make it worth it to make the trip. So I just I really have to cherry pick. I've, I've sent a lot of things to um, fairs and festivals. Those are really what we enjoy playing because we can do a lot of original music there, as opposed to a nightclub where you have to play a lot of cover songs. But honestly, I, I love. I'm trying to figure out a way where I can put out more of my original songs. It's so expensive here in Nashville. Um, I, I just I just love to get more of it out there and just share what I do with the world. It, that's really the main goal. Can't you put together and I and I don't know. I mean, I don't know what it costs anymore. But couldn't you sure. put together a smaller studio at home that you could record in that still would sound good? Well, that's that's what I'm talking about. Um, I haven't. I've been working on songwriting and putting the band together, and you know, really concentrating on shows and things like that. And uh, I haven't really. Uh, the, the problem is when you work and you play, there's only so much time in the day. Yeah, but once you, you have know? your little studio at home on your weekends when you're home or when you got a couple days at home or whatever, you could be jamming. Right, right. And it's it's a little hard to do. Right now I'm renting out a room in a house with um, four other people because it keeps the cost down. <laughs> uh, and and they're good, actually. My roommate's my drummer, and then there's another guy next to me. He um, he plays guitar, and then my, my other roommate, Amanda, she... Um, She's trying to get into artist management, so it's it's really nice, but it's not really conducive to building a studio or anything. Oh, so I hopefully, see. hopefully in the next uh, year or so, I'll be able to get a piece of property up here in Nashville and um, and maybe put something like that on it. You know, because I mean, do you really need you know an eight hundred channel board? I don't think you do. I mean, I've heard no, some great music come through a cell phone, so you know, six eight channels. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can still get great sound if you set everything up the right way. That's right. That's right. Unfortunately, like in the, in the place I'm in now, like the air conditioning unit runs right outside my window. You know, <laughs> you know, you know we have I mean? the same issue over here. <laughs> so I, I actually have thought a lot about what you're saying, and I'm, I'm sort of coming to that conclusion. I can for the for the cost. I mean, for four songs to do them uh, as an independent ar artist here, it was like it was like ten, twelve grand. Yeah, and I think I for mean, less I, than that, you could put together a nice little studio if you put it in the right room that, you know, gives you the right ambience. I think, you know, I just I, I just don't understand how people can say, well, i got to save up all this money to get in the studio, and they save up all this yeah. money, and that money they saved up, they could have just, like, made their own and still sounded good. And then, when you're big and famous that, and you're making all that money, then you can go into a better studio if that's what you want. That's... Uh, that's sort of where I'm at. And, and you have to remember that everybody's at a different point in their life and everybody, it takes experience to figure out what you want to do. And regardless of how I feel about how much it costs to record and you know, those guys do a good job. I don't, I'm not saying they're not worth it, uh, but I needed something. I put out an album 
a few years ago, and it was just to get something on the table. I needed something that was more professionally done for marketing, and I didn't have time to learn how to do it yet. So now I can kind of sit back and I can use those songs still. You know, they got a lot of life left in them. I can use those songs while I, you know, circle back and maybe try to figure out some things on my own. And, and you're absolutely right. I can literally, I haven't looked into it yet, but I bet for ten grand I could send myself to a recording school. I don't know why not. I mean, of course, I can't say... I don't know what it costs. You know, when I went to broadcasting school way back in the 80s, it then, of course, it wasn't cheap. But now that I look back on it, even in those days, it wasn't that expensive for what I got out of it. And you're, look, and you're looking at, it's not like I got to go to a four-year university. You know, you're looking at something very specific. Like, I can go take classes on how to use Pro Tools and how to set up a room. I can, I mean, I can find an a engineer down here and I can pay him to teach me. It doesn't even have to be through a school. I could just go sit in and watch people. You might find you are capable of doing it on your own right from the beginning because it seems to me if you can play music and you can hear music and you can feel music, why couldn't you put down who you are, you know? That's right. That's right. Now, I know it sounds, fair, I it sounds easy from my point of view, but... Right. And there's a lot of things that go into making a country album sound like a country album. There's a lot of instruments. I want to gosh, on the ones we did, there's probably, there's probably 12 instruments on that CD. You know, well, so but that's not tracks. saying that I can't. I can hire a guy myself and bring him into my studio. So you can always find another roommate that's an engineer. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> have you got any? Have Have you got an EP out or or what do we call them nowadays? CDs, EPs. I, what are we calling them? Yeah, I have that. I did four. I did four songs down there at Sony, and those are the four. I, I think they're all on my website. They may not be. Um, that guy, look up. Hell yeah, and Wildside were all done at the same time. That was the second one that I did. Now there was an older EP that was a six song one that I did when I was up still in New England. But I was really, I was really getting my legs underneath me, and since then I've really spent time learning how to write write a decent song that at least will compete with a commercial market. If you understand what I mean. We didn't get the Wildside one. I'm gonna have to look that up. Being in Nashville, you, you know, you could easily be chewed up and spat out. You spat out. Spat out. I'm English, don't you? Know? <laughs> yeah, She's, you could she be, still cracks me up once in a while. <laughs> you could be chewed up and spat out or flushed That's down right. the toilet. Are you willing to sell yourself, sell your soul <clears throat> to be how they want you to be in Nashville? You know, are you willing to change who you are, change your style, change how you do things to become a recording artist? Nah. Nah. nah because at, at that point. <laughs> At that point, I mean, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't warm your soul. Like it doesn't fulfill you as a person. I mean, if, if you're doing this again, if you choose, if you go, all right, I'm going to do music as my job and I want to be as successful as I can because I want to make as most, the most money possible. You know, that, that's what a lot of people want out of it. Um, you know, I, I'm an artist and I want to express what I have to say. And although I understand that there's certain ways to do it, like you can be an artist and not know how to write a song and people will listen to it and go, uh, I'm not really feeling it, you know, but I don't need, I play songs in front of people who enjoy what I do all the time. I don't need a radio station or a record exec telling me that it's good. If I play a song and I play it three or four times out and people aren't getting into it, guess what? Like I take it out of my set because I, I can tell like that's, that's really my metric. I look out and see if people are enjoying the song and if people are loving it, then who the hell needs a radio station to tell you it's good? Yeah. The people will tell people word of mouth. I mean, we sometimes hear songs. We sometimes hear songs on the radio, and it's supposedly country, and it just <coughs> sounds like a boy band. It sounds like yeah. it sounds like these people have been molded. It's that into, Nashville sound, baby. Yeah, they've been molded into into doing it in a particular way, and I just hope that all you guys that come on this show are going to stick to who you are. You, you know, you've got to oh, be comfortable. Sure. With, you've got to be comfortable with the decisions you make. If, like you say, if you're just out for the money, and you're naturally talented, and you know you can make a lot of money out of your talent then and you're happy with that decision i don't suppose it matters but i hope that a lot of people that we have on this show have more about them than that yeah it's um there's a reason why the radio stations and the record labels do what they do though and you know people started devaluing music and nobody thinks it's worth anything and these guys are trying to find the only way that they can to make money which i totally understand it's a business and um if they're finding that they're not making money by developing people, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like that's kind of on the audience. If if they don't want to support local music and they don't want to support new um, people that are experimenting with new sounds and and all they're doing is paying for concerts for you know bands that all sound alike, 
then I really can't blame record labels or radio stations for, for gravitating towards that kind of music. It's it's not really their fault. They're just doing what they can to make money, you know? That's what it's all about. Show me the money. That's it. It's a business. Music business. No business, no music. So what <laughs> advice do you give to the future Colin Axwell five years down the line when you're rich and famous? What advice have you got for yourself? Um, honestly, stay neutral. You know, there's a lot of people that want to drag you into drama. Uh, if if you even even if you really don't get along with somebody, if you just kind of like sit back and, and keep it to yourself and do what you got to do, like just tune out the noise. Then at some point, you know, even the people that you think really don't like you or that things didn't go well with, like sometimes those are the people that surprise you the most. Yes. Sometimes there's uh, there's opportunity hiding in the least likely place, and so just keep all your keep all your connections, keep all your doors open. Like when you see drama going down. Stay away from it. Just do your thing. Like, make your music the best you can and let it speak for itself and the rest. You'll be all right. I might take that advice to heart. I need to learn to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Don't you just? <laughs> I'm a miserable bastard when it comes to somebody trying to tell me what to do, how to do it, when to do it. I'm that old school. Well, you know what? I'm an yeah. adult. I'm that old school. I'm an adult. I'm a big boy. I'm grown up. I can make I my own decisions. I have one request of your husband, and that's not to not cut your toenails during the show, <laughs> during interviews. You know, when I play back some of these interviews, all I can hear is clip, 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 Now, clip. I've been nice and quiet over here tonight because this, this is a nice talking with this guy, so shut up. <laughs> you just you just tell him it's, uh, make him feel bad. Make her feel bad. Tell her it's your pacemaker. <laughs> <laughs> She'll rip it out. I can believe that. <laughs> uh, there's a the big thing right now is Channel Five News down here in Nashville just did a story about uh, band paying to play at CMA Fest because the bars will actually charge artists to come down and play. I've heard and, that. Um, right, and I I mean I won't do it, but I also that's that's a very good opportunity to keep your mouth shut and just you know all right. So I don't believe in it. I'm not going to do it. There's uh, there's other people right now that are just really getting in the weeds. You know, really, uh, you know, maybe that's their fight. I don't know, but it just—it just seems like it just seems like once you people will hate your music because they hate your politics. You know, yeah, they're like that. Absolutely. Yep. The minute you the minute you intervene, that's the other thing. Don't talk about politics. Like, just leave it out. Doesn't yeah. matter what you think. If you want to be successful in music, don't lose half your audience. <laughs> Religion, politics. And what was the other one? Transgender but, uh, toilets. People argue over transgender toilets too. Religion. Stay away yeah. From the Did you mention religion? <laughs> religion. Yeah. It's not. None of that is worth talking about. Like why? Why? Unless you're raging against the machine and your whole platform is screw the government, <laughs> then fine. Talk about it. But everybody else, like, I mean, ask the Dixie Chicks. They lost half their audience just because they had to be political. Like, just just leave it out. What about the girls in Russia? They got thrown in prison for speaking out oh uh, yeah who was that was that like tattoo or something i uh, you know what i don't remember which what the name of the group was but i just remember tattoo they all was went always very for... controversial anyway wasn't it that's the way they yeah. come across anyway but we you don't remember, that? You remember those guys <laughs> yeah yeah i do um that's funny who tattoo yeah, oh, when, yeah i think they came out when i was at school and then they were they come across as i don't i i can't remember very much about it unfortunately but they come across as lesbians and you know, out yeah, the they were pop and, singers, and yeah, you know, going against all the rules, you know, and it was uh, very controversial back then. Well, as you can tell, we don't discuss any of that crap because that's what I think it is, pretty much. And you know, I don't think anybody's, <laughs> I don't think anybody's private views are anybody's business. We just <clears throat> like to shoot the shit and find out who you are and what's going on. What do you drive? You got a pickup yeah, truck? I have a couple different vehicles. I have a um, gosh, what? A- Why are you thinking of your vehicle, Dan Conley, in yeah. the chat room? says that it was Pussy Riot. It was abandoned Russia. Pussy oh. Riot. Yeah, that's right. Pussy Riot. That's the one. With a name like oh, that, what um, do you expect? <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, sometimes you got to shake it up. That's, <laughs> and like I said, if, if you're going to shake it up, by all means, shake it up. But if, if you're going to... If you're gonna try to, uh, if you're gonna try to hold the whole audience, that's maybe not the best idea. Um, let me see. I have a uh, Hyundai Tucson. I know that's not a very country car, but that gets me back and forth to work. And then I, um, and then I have a Dodge Dakota. Oh, a Dodge! I, Good God! Doesn't anybody drive a Ford anymore? <laughs> you know, I've never really worried about getting involved in that fight either. I'm just that's, happy everybody's buying American cars. Uh, that's you're just not sensible country. decision. You're a sensible boy. You're just not country without a four wheel drive. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I used to, again, I used to live up in New England, and um, I had a, a Ford Escape that I was driving around, oh. and I forget I forget what happened, but the transmission went or something, and, and I had to get a car quick, and I had a dealership across the street, and that Hyundai was there, and I said, well, it is what it is, and I took it off the lot, and that was that. <laughs> How do you pull up to a construction site in a Tucson? Uh, I do whatever I want, mostly. <laughs> that a boy. That's what I'm talking about right there. Yeah, I don't, I don't listen to... The, the, the more you can tune out the noise, the better. I mean... That's right. I just think if, if people don't like my car, they're just, you know, they're just hating that they don't have the new age soccer van. That's, that's on them. <laughs> <laughs> don't you want to be a soccer dad? Don't you want to live in the city in a cookie-cutter house? <laughs> oh, gosh, no. No, I, I spent some <laughs> weekends in New York City not too long ago, and, um... Hey, hey, oh, you don't have me. to tell me you should see Dallas and all the suburbs. We've, you know, been working in some of those houses. Oh, my God. You look out the window and you're, like, looking in a mirror. It's ridiculous. Yeah, well, the last place I stayed in New York City, um, you looked out the window and that's where they kept the garbage. So, There's I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> you have a Facebook page, correct? I do. I do. And a web page. look at my name, you'll find it. Yeah, my, my name.com is the website. Kept it easy. Now, is it triple X okay. on, the, on those pages, too? It is. Okay. It is. That's easy enough. Uh, a couple questions yeah. here for you, and we'll let you go. All right, man. What have you got? What is your favorite word? No. Oh, pickle. Easily. Pickle? <laughs> <laughs> what is your least favorite word? Uh, I don't know. Moist. <laughs> <laughs> That's Randy's favorite word. <laughs> That's my favorite word. What yes. turns you on? Um... What turns me on, like in a in a physical sense? In any way, what turns you on? What's the biggest thing that just turns you on? Um, when you know that when you know that somebody cares about you, um, it, like when you when you have when you have people in your life that um, you know you can count on because it doesn't happen that often. Real people. Yeah, yeah. When you find when you find someone, or just the thought of finding people that uh, are, are real, you know, yeah, like you say, just real people that you can count on, like that. That's what, a good day when you can find someone like that. What turns you off? Ah, uh, cigarette smoking. Well, Whoa, husband, I just put my last one out. in your face, husband. What sound do you love? What sound do I love? Yeah. Um, whew, I do love me a D minor chord. What sound do you hate? Um, what sound do I hate? Mm, oh, yeah, I used to have this roommate live next door who bought one of those old-fashioned <laughs> alarm clocks <laughs> and slept through it. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. What, so we'll go with that. What's your favorite curse word? Um, I think I think anything I say will probably just come across as a beep, right? I, no. No, internet. You can say whatever you want on here. Oh, yeah, man, but I, I got fans in the Bible Belt. Come on. Um, it's your Bible. Read it the way you want. Yeah, yeah. Do you never Favorite. say bloody hell? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, in my own time, I'm, I'm sure I, I'm guilty of lots of things. You're a construction um, worker. I cut you lots of slack. Oh, yeah. No, we. I mean, honestly, in construction, everybody drops the F-bombs all the time. Absolutely. <laughs> Not on stage. Never on stage. <laughs> What profession other than yours would you like to attempt? And you can either go with music or with construction, whichever one you prefer. What what, what career would I like to attempt? Yeah, besides yours. All uh, right, you know what would be cool? You ever hear about those guys who uh, take frozen chickens and shoot them into airplane engines? Yeah, of course. That's, what? That, that, sounds, <laughs> that sounds like a good job. Has Mike Rowe done that yet? I don't know. But st <laughs> like a stuntman would be cool, like doing movie stunts. That'd be sweet. What profession would you not like to do? Uh, anything involving blood, doctor, surgeon, um, ER, uh, you know, uh, EMT, even even like the the person who like pricks the finger for the physical, like that's no, I'm I'm all set with that. And this must be why we prefer frozen chickens. <laughs> right? Yeah. No. I, <laughs> if heaven, I don't want to hurt the animals, I just want to eat them. Exactly. Barbecued, preferably. <laughs> if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get to the pearly gates? Um. Heaven exists. What would I like to hear him say at the pearly gates? Uh, Colin. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it'd be funny if he said like back of the line. <laughs> <laughs> now that's one we haven't heard before. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't. About, I don't want to hear you're that. Drunk. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to hear that because it's like the the best thing to hear. But I, I like to laugh, and I think if I were, if I got to heaven and he said you back of the line, like I would probably laugh, and that would be worth it. <laughs> Colin, go home. You're drunk. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my I had God. a um I had a what did I say? Uh I wrote a, a lyric the other day about God. It was um I wrote a I, I wrote a, sc- a scribbled note on the envelope and sent it. Gosh, it was something about sending a scribbled note up to God and and him sent. No, it was I sent a I sent a prayer up there. That's what it was. I sent a prayer upstairs to heaven and the good Lord sent it back with a scribbled note on an envelope. Said I ain't got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome! <laughs> There's a song in there somewhere. That's right. I ain't got time for that. Well, we wrote a song. Actually, we ended up writing a song called I "Ain't Got Time for That," but it didn't involve religion. Did that come from that uh, that chick that? Ain't nobody got time for that. Yeah, that's it. What's that? There was a. Uh number of years ago that uh she was a black woman that was on tv and she kept saying i ain't got time for that oh yeah ain't nobody got time for that i remember that <laughs> yeah that, that that was quite a song for a while i think we played that on the show way back when oh i didn't know i didn't i remember who you're talking about but i can't i don't remember a song out of it oh yeah there was a song out of that somebody put it together one of those uh auto tunes i think or something like that that's funny i'll have to i'll have to look that up oh i'm sure you should be easy to find it shouldn't take much I will send it over to the Facebook chat where I posted the phone number today. Well, awesome. Okay. Awesome. Right, perfect. Nice to have you come hang out with us for a little while and just chit-chat. Uh, you sound like a good, straightforward kind of guy with a good sense of humor. Good luck with uh, everything. Sounds like you're headed in the right direction. You know what you're getting into and you know where you're headed. Pretty cool. So are you working on, uh, you're just working on uh, getting some new tunes lined up and then maybe an EP eventually? I got about 25 songs to record. I just... I'm trying to figure out how to do it. Well, just get them to us when you do, because we'll be glad to play them first. We love this stuff. Yeah. Fantastic. We've got so Absolutely. many great yep. artists come through here. we got more great music than we know what to do with. We can't thank you enough. Well, Donna, Randy, I appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for having me on with you guys tonight. It's It's been fun. Not a problem. Go get them, cowboy. I will do our best. Thank you, sir. We'll see you later. Good night, Colin. Good night, everybody. Bye. This is Bye. your summer radio station. The Yankee and the Brit Show on RTM Radio. Here's Colin Axwell. Hell yeah. Right here with the Yankee and the Brit. Sunday. Do you want to climb to the top of that tree? Go belly flopping in the lake with me. Hell